Welcome to the PeopleSoft Chat Podcast. Our guest this episode is Guy Waterman, Senior Director of Product Strategy for Oracle HCM Cloud. And now, here's your podcast host, Senior Director of Product Strategy at Oracle, Robin Validum. Welcome, everybody, to the PeopleSoft Chat Podcast. We have a very special guest with us today, Guy Waterman. Guy is a Senior Director of Product Strategy with the Oracle HCM Cloud Team. Guy, welcome to the PeopleSoft Chat Podcast. Thanks, Robin. It's great to be here. You know, Guy, we got together, I think it was in 2019, we met at the beautiful Austin uh, headquarters now, and we started talking about the cloud product as it relates to PeopleSoft customers. You remember when we met? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And it is a great facility, isn't it? It's awesome. It's, it's, it's beautiful. I was very impressed by it. I think that was probably the first time I got a chance to sit down and talk to someone who has put in the, the time on the cloud application side for Oracle, but then we weren't talking about one product or the other. We were just talking about from the perspective of a PeopleSoft customer. What are they experiencing right now as Oracle as their vendor? And what sorts of questions would they have? Do you remember that conversation that we had? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We agreed that we, we should talk more often, and we did. We started talking on a regular basis. And we, we also talked about doing some type of fireside chat. And I think this podcast is probably as close as we've gotten so far to doing what we had envisioned back then. But um, I'm hoping that it's we'll have more of these types of conversations where we help our audience, PeopleSoft customers, understand what's all the hubbub about the cloud. Maybe first I'll ask you to maybe um, tell the audience a little bit about who you are and what your experience has been, particularly as it relates to uh, HCM and the cloud. Oh, absolutely. Great. Well, again, thanks for having me. And I really appreciate the, the time to visit with you all. And from my perspective, this feels like every day because one of my responsibilities in the strategy organization is to visit with our existing customers, to understand what the challenges are that they're facing, to really see what is on the horizon that is the high priority for them. I've been with the product line here from a cloud perspective since before this thing had a name. That actually started about 2008 timeframe, 2007 timeframe, and have been working with the team, particularly in the technology components and then also in the HCM cloud since we launched in 2011. So if you think about it, we've been at this for a decade. During that time, I've had a chance to visit with many of our great customers that are thinking about moving from an on-premise environment into the cloud and then what makes sense for them to do it, what would be the justification for them to do it. So that's been my life for the last 10 years in addition to be able to uh, really now focus on that common technology layer. So when we were first talking about this, you wanted to have some you know, dialogue around what the technology involves and how are we leveraging the Oracle database and Oracle technology and innovation for the benefit of our customers? What does it mean to an HCM customer? And I've been living that for the last five years for sure. So it's definitely, I think we're at a point now where we're able to get a number of really great examples and use cases for people to consider and understand how others have considered their transition if they were moving to the cloud or their decision to stay where they are because it made sense for them to do that as well. Yeah, you know, you mentioned how you've kind of been in the on the team here for since the inception, since it had a name or had a, pre, a different name. I mean, 10 years can seem like a long time. It could also seem like a short amount of time considering the amount of functionality that's gone into the product. I know with your role, Guy, over the time, you've, you've actually looked at kind of played a behind the scenes role where you've put together content, uh, but then you've also met with customers individually and, and, and been at conferences. I get customers that tell me, wow, it doesn't seem like it's been that long since the cloud team has been, um, been at it and put, putting together the application. Only, that's probably because they probably haven't been paying close attention to it, especially if they're running PeopleSoft. Can you talk a little bit about what you've seen over this past 10 years, like what, what, what that evolution has looked like over that time? I mean, I know it covers a lot of ground, but what are some of the things that maybe stand out that you've noticed being kind of in that uh, area? Well, that's a great question because it's really one of growth, of investment, innovation, and a lot of collaboration. I, I think that 
from our perspective, you know, coming in as Oracle and working with customers, there was always this sense of Oracle is just the application provider. You know, we're more the, the community and we were separate. And what has happened over the last 10 years is the establishment of a community where we collaborate constantly with customers. We began with the vision of a core HR system. And it wasn't initially HR, but it quickly evolved into human capital management, HCM. And what's the difference between HR and HCM? It's the inclusion on a common database of talent management capabilities, plus other things in the HR sphere of influence, whether it's workforce health and safety incidents, whether it ends up being work life or sentiment analysis that we're seeing some of those uh, things rising uh, at this point. And of course, then the integration of all of the technology that enables that. But over that, that time frame. Specifically what we've seen, I think that we ended up with a core HR system. We added to it payroll. Payroll then became talent and rather time and absence. We needed those capabilities uh, as well as benefits. Then adding on goals, performance, talent review, succession, and then beginning to look at other capabilities like career development. But then we hit the pause button and we continued developing on the cloud, but we also had acquired Taleo. So that brought in a whole infusion of people that were very focused on talent management and the talent management space itself. Not just talent acquisition, because we think of Taleo as recruiting, but they had a full suite from learning to goals, performance, talent review, succession management, career development. So the best minds there melded with the team that was already in place to build what is now part of that overall human capital management suite. Realistically, in the last three years, what we've seen is that infusion now of that solid core of HCM functions to include a lot of the technologies like the digital assistant, innovations around AI, natural language processing capabilities, the reintroduction of the analytics components that are super exciting. And I'm doing some very cool things with those now. We'll talk about that later. But then also um, adding on new functional areas that enable the whole notion of internal mobility and the idea that I can leverage my strategic workforce planning component to tell me the skills that I need, take an inventory of the analysis or the skills that I have within my workforce, project where those skills could be in 24 months, and then plan toward that realization, put in hiring plans and other career growth plans. So what we're seeing is the evolution of a common platform that enables us to really manage all the different parts of HR to talent to workforce management all in one platform. So that's really what we've been doing in the last several years. And, and I'm super excited to you know, share with you some of the other thoughts that we're working on uh, as we look at our planning horizon as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's 10 years well spent because um, like you mentioned, there were acquisitions during that that time period. There's uh, development technology that was going into that and functionality to meet the basic requirements, the table stakes for HR, right? I mean, you have to have certain things in the system as a system of record, but then also keeping up with the standards that have been evolving over this time in HR, you know, things like you know, performance management has changed a lot. Talent management, like you mentioned, has changed a lot. Career goals, uh, career pathing has changed a lot, even just in the last few years as a newer generation comes into the workplace. All of those types of things that you're able to adapt to on the, on the cloud side is really important. I'll, I'll, I'll use this time right now just to share with the audience that you know, one of the questions I get from customers is around why I will spend some time in my roadmap sessions talking about the Oracle Cloud product. I don't spend a whole lot of time, but I spend enough time because I want customers to know what's going on. I mean, we're your vendor, right? Oracle is your vendor. PeopleSoft is one suite of applications that our customers are running, but they need to also be aware of what the other investments are being made um, around HCM and financials and, and the, the stack itself, the technology stack itself. Because one day, maybe it's tomorrow, maybe it's 10 years from now or 20 years from now, whatever, um, a transition, you know, the customers may make that transition. And when they, when they start looking at it, I want them to be educated. I want them to be prepared to understand what's going on in that, in that area. And that's why it's so important 
for us to have a conversation and for me to invite you on the on the podcast because I think it's important for customers to be aware of the investment that's being made in that area. Well, as we're talking about this, this is it's a community, and mm-hmm. it, you know, you and I when we got together, it was like we we were long lost friends, almost picking up our conversations right where it left off, and and it just felt natural. And that's the way that we work within the teams. There's no separation between different product lines within the Oracle family. And we want that same capability, that same feeling to be there within our customers as well, our customer base. We're all part of the same family. We're all trying to invest in solutions that make overall HR better. And sometimes we invest in the the leader out of the gate. The innovator is going to be the PeopleSoft solution with some of the capabilities that they've done, the innovations you've done around the fluid user experience, around some of the ongoing uh, analytic capabilities that exist to adopting the Oracle Digital Assistant uh, along with the cloud team, uh, we did that together. We defined a lot of the use cases and we're able to leverage those capabilities and the, the design, if you will, together so that we can make you know, all of our customers very productive and realizing a lot of the same benefits as well. So you've got a, a, a group of people here that have been doing not only application software, but HR software for well over 30 years. And the benefit that we have is that we've seen a lot of these moves come out in the marketplace. I remember, you know, back when um, my very first job was an HR developer Mm -hmm. at an old company based in Atlanta, Georgia, and doing string testing uh, with that organization. And I can remember people leaving our team and going to start work for PeopleSoft. But it's been, you know, that kind of a community that we have is that our customers have moved with us and we want to make sure that they get the benefit of this brain trust of not only technology uh, advantage, but HR business process advantage. And and I think that that's something that comes through very well with the teamwork that that our teams have uh, established together and would love to see that carry over it even more so into the customer base as we evolve the user groups that that are now established. I agree. I mean... You know, I, I've, I've had customers comment when they see the, they see a demo of the cloud product and they see a demo, of, let's say new fluid capabilities in PeopleSoft. They said, I see some similarities between the UI, you know, and that's because, you know, we share a UX team, a usability team, a design team uh, that has those guidelines in place, you know, and there are some similarities between the products. Before I get into that, though, I wanted to find out from you, one of the big questions that we get from customers who are looking at the PeopleSoft product or working with the PeopleSoft product. And then I, I tell them, hey, let's, let's, let's at least get you educated on what's going on on the cloud side. You'll get that, we'll get that response of, man, I, but I just love my PeopleSoft. <laughs> and you know it because you've worked with PeopleSoft customers. You work with PeopleSoft customers on a regular basis. I know that. Right. I just love my PeopleSoft. I, 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 know, I know how it works. I know all the configurations. I know where all the um, you know, where everything is, I'm not quite ready to forget about all that. Why can't you just make what I'm running? Why can't you just make the PeopleSoft product a cloud product and we'll just run with that, right? Um, and that's that's an end user talking. And right. and um, and you and I, before we started recording the podcast, you had a great analogy about that. I was hoping you maybe you could share that with people. Oh yeah, absolutely. And it's funny because when I go back and and I've been gone from Atlanta for 20 years, but Love the house that I had there. It, it was it was great. It was the house that we brought our kids home to. Mm-hmm. It, it it meant a lot to us. But when I had the opportunity to move to Texas, I wish that I had been able to just take that house with the lot with the trees and pick it up from Atlanta and just teleport it over into uh, Texas. I knew that that's where my life was taking me. That's where my wife was from, and we wanted our kids to grow up here. That's very similar to where I see so many PeopleSoft customers is that they're looking at the solutions that they've got. They're very comfortable with it. It's almost as if you look at things and say, they're sure there are always things that I would like to change, but I can do that over time. And that ability to just be able to move right over into something else is, um, I, I mean, there's a lot of comfort in that because you know what you know. But then I, I always transition a little bit to cars because I own cars, I pay for them and I ride them until the wheels come off. You know, my wife laughs at me for doing that. But it's not until I get into the, and she's a new car person. So get into one of her cars and I look at it and 
you get the cooled ventilated seats. And I was like, well, what's this? That's kind of nice. And they have the backup cameras and the XM radio and, you know, the ability to do all kinds of fancy things start from, you know, a half mile away, those kinds of things. And new car smell. <laughs> oh, well, the new car smell too, right? But <laughs> there, there you go. But then, but I don't have to deal with the salesperson, right? Mm-hmm. That's the thing. And I'm mm-hmm. keeping my people soft. I'm not dealing with the, the car seal, the salesman uh, in the showroom type of a thing. But, and there's comfort to that for me, but I also look at those other capabilities and say, you know, those do make sense. And some of those things I do want, uh, and I want to be able to take advantage of. Part of it there is going to be, uh, Robin, that we just need to really balance what are the capabilities that are coming with the ability for customers to uptake that capability and then understand the value that they're going to achieve from it. In the course of 10 years, I'll say that there have been an accumulation of those things, whether it's vented seats, rear window monitors, whether it's um, you know the lane assist and the special lighting, et cetera. It, it's not necessarily one thing, but I think it just comes down to an accumulation of many things that are on a platform that we're gonna see, you know, being able to, to take advantage of moving forward. And I always go back in my mind to, you know, when, when PeopleSoft, I remember when PeopleSoft was created, right? I, I remember how, you know, it was the 87, 90 timeframe when people were, we, we saw the emergence of PeopleSoft. But at that time, mobile phones were still a bag that you hung on your shoulder, right? We, we didn't think about integrating mobile phones with applications. And then you add to that other capabilities like video uh, for training or, uh, multimedia for responses for people to do introductions of themselves to really then the use of things like artificial intelligence and being able to speak to computers. We always joked that 2010, a space odyssey where you had how the computer and you were talking to it was something we would never see in our lifetime. I actually organized the product that you can speak to within HCM to build an analytics dashboard. That's pretty amazing to me. So it just ends up being one of these things that we see that there's an accumulation of technology that exists out there. We'll use as much of it as we can within both platforms. Uh, But I think that at some point, we're going to begin seeing that we're just going to have more and more available that's easier to consume uh, than being on an on-premise pup cycle where we're doing some updates and basically addressing functional changes every year or two years within the product. Yeah, I, you know, and I know that customers, when we're when they're running on premise, the difficulty for them comes with no matter what type of new technologies or functionality that we can deliver as a PeopleSoft development team, they still have to take it. The customers still have to find ways to get it into their environment. And a lot of times we're just we're moving at a very fast pace and they're not able to keep up or have the plans or the calendar set up so that they can keep up. But one thing that sometimes people don't understand, uh, particularly with the cloud environment, is that a lot of that new innovation that you were talking about, you know, that this becomes available in the instance that they're running. Just flip it on, switch it on, right? And, and, and there it is. You don't have to rely on, a, uh, on another team to evaluate what those new features are and put them into their environment. It's already there. And I think that's part of being able to stay current, stay competitive, right. have your competitive edge with your within your industry and take on new things without having to even think too much about it. Because the more you think about it, sometimes you come up with reasons not to do something. If it's already in your environment, it's just a matter of going in there and playing around with it, making sure that it works right. And then you're good to go. That's exactly right. I mean, if you if it's there and you can just try it out and use it and the vast majority of things that you're going to find within the application that we've announced really in the last 24 months are all included in the core product. Things like journeys that we just announced and the skills assistant that we've announced as well. Those are all included with the product and they're there from a release update standpoint. The thing that's a little bit different, I think from an on-premise standpoint to the cloud is that we do update the system four times a year. One of the things I find is that there are customers that will take the minimum. In essence, if there's only thing there, something that I have to take, that I have to recognize, then I'll do that. But they still stay with that on-premise release update frequency. 
right? So they're going to go ahead and look at the at the cycle of saying, well, we're going to let three releases build up and then we'll address it, or we're going to let six releases build up and then we'll look at the functional component and then we'll do like a big enhancement implementation project type of thing. When really what we've designed from a cloud perspective is the ability for you to take incremental change. There's this whole notion of, it's called continuous innovation, continuous deployment, CICD. And that's something that is a, it's almost like a, an agile development methodology and agile implementation methodology. But it's the idea that continuous and never ending improvement is something that we need to be able to manage to. And to incrementally uptake other capabilities is very important. And we do this with minimum disruption. One of the things I'll throw in, because I think that this was uh, a testament to really where we're headed with the solution is the fact that the downtime that, that you experience with the application, when we talk about scheduled downtime, these are times that we tell you the system will be taking it offline so that we can apply different things for update perspectives and be able to do certain types of patching we can't do while the system is running. Last year, we have an initiative called Zero Downtime. Uh, from a downtime perspective, and I'm not going to play the guess how many hours, but I can share with you that we started north of 175 hours a year that you were scheduled to be down for the four updates that we would have. Last year, we actually took the last four quarters. It was less than a cumulative 16 hours of downtime for four updates. So you look at that. That's pretty amazing. That's less than four hours per update that you're offline. And it's usually done in the middle of the night when it's not impacting you. So the innovation that we're seeing here and the automation that we're seeing is something that's designed to take the workload off of the HR team, off of the IT team, off of your employees who expect a system to be able to be there when, when they get home on a Friday night or if they're working over the weekend that they're going to be able to see that capability. And with that kind of minimal downtime to be experienced across a, a full year of use, that's a great resource that you've added to your workforce. So um, it, we're starting to see, like I said, after a decade, real signs of things that are different for people to be able to, to leverage. Yeah, and that's 16 hours. I mean, you get so much with that. You know, it's not just down for, let's say maintenance, you're getting new stuff, you're getting new functionality. Oh, wow. And whether you use it or not is up to you, but you don't have to make that decision whether to pull it into your environment or not. And that's one of the things that with PeopleSoft customers will have to still make that decision, right? Anybody that's on-premise has to make that decision. Once they've seen the feature, you know, that we've we've delivered um, in the in the general available code line, they still have to decide, are we gonna take that feature now or are we gonna take it later? And that decision can be a difficult one because you can't always predict the future. You don't really always know what is going to be important. So it's actually a, a comforting that to know that the features that are being worked on by the Oracle team is already in the product. And it's just a matter of flipping it on when you're ready. And there may be some things that get automatically triggered, but you know you can make that decision, but you don't have to make the decision to implement it. You just have to make a decision to start using it. I think there's a it's, a, it's an important distinction to make. Absolutely. Well, and, and an interesting thing and kind of a secret for, for the listeners out there, it's not a secret because it's it's available, but people just don't know that it's there. Uh, if you go to cloud.oracle.com and go to the HR section, there's actually a spreadsheet that you will be able to download from that particular page. And it's the release readiness review page. It's what's new. But there's a spreadsheet out there that goes back to 2018, and you actually have the major line items of all deliverables that are out there. And you can see, you know, if it was a required release update, if it was something that, you know, you could defer, if you will, just like it can be installed, but I don't have to pay attention to it. But that spreadsheet that you begin to look at, you realize that, you know, we're delivering, you know, 100 new features in every release across the entire suite, of course. Um, but it, it's significant because what we're finding is that we're able to provide those things that enable you to stay current or better yet, ahead of others in the marketplace that you're competing with for the same talent. So whether it ends up being that you're competing because you're offering better positions to their employees or to people from the same talent pool, or even better, that you're able to provide a better career path and experience for your existing customers so they never consider or your existing employees, I'm sorry. So they never consider moving to another organization. 
that's really what that's about. So we're really focused on trying to make sure that we're not only going to have people like myself be able to be, you know, engaged in this. Some people will look at me and say, he's an older guy. He's been around a while. He doesn't really care about innovation. I love innovation. <laughs> I want it all. Yeah. I compete with my son uh, who just graduated from school and he hired on at a technology company that is pretty close to my heart. But he also, he looks at technology and he thinks that it's really great, but I try to outdo him on it. And I'll tell you what, we, we've got pretty cool solutions out there, but it's, <laughs> it's pretty awesome to see that, um, you know, we have solutions that apply to everyone in the workforce. Again, I just think that we're, we're on the precipice of doing some really fantastic things with other, other technologies. And I'm sure we'll touch on that in a little bit. That's why we work at Oracle. We, we, we work at Oracle because of the technology and, um, and then also the, the vast number of customers to be able to service not just a particular industry, but all shapes and size mm-hmm. customers all over the world, right? And that's the, really at the heart of why I think many of us work, work at Oracle to be able to, to do that. You'd mentioned journeys a little while ago, which I, is a feature that I really love that I think addresses a lot of the things we've been talking about, including how HR is evolving and how the cloud team can get some of the new functionality into a production environment for their customers pretty quickly to meet meet today's you know standards. So I think journeys has been something that customers have needed, but they never really were able to articulate it. It really gives employees the opportunity to not only figure out where they want to go, but with the marketplace, able to market their own skills. Because as you work for an organization, and we've we've experienced it ourselves through blood, sweat, and tears about trying to figure out how do we make an impression on the organization that we work for? How do we let people know what we're capable of doing? How do we know about available projects that we would love to do, even do as a side gig. You know, I'll work extra hours to do because it's something so interesting or something that uses a skill that I already have. For the longest time, there was no real way of doing that. And then now with journeys and with the marketplace and the cloud, you can do that. And quite honestly, it's very important to this gen, the new generation coming into the workplace. They value being able to work on projects that are interesting and somehow contribute to the company's bottom line, they want to know about those and they want people to know about their skills. You want to talk a little bit about those two areas and, and how, that, how that meets today's standards? Absolutely. Yeah. The, well, Journeys is, is exciting. And if, if your listeners haven't really heard about it, there are Oracle Live events that are recorded that you can look up and on OTube, which is Oracle's version of YouTube. I think we actually subscribe to a YouTube channel for that. But you can go out and you can see what we did on the introduction of that. Similarly, we did the same thing with with our skills advisor um, announcement as well. But Journeys is, to me, special because, as you mentioned, Robin, guided learning is something that I always thought was really interesting and something where you know, user experiences should be able to walk you through what you need to do. And you shouldn't have to sit in a four-hour training class to be able to fill out, you know, a timesheet. You shouldn't have to sit in a week-long course to understand how to configure something that should be logical, right? Just to, to add a field to a page or something like that. And I used to train users on how to do those things in, you know, my early career. Uh, so I, I led training courses to do those kinds of things. But Journeys is the the opportunity for us to get away from that. It's really to deliver on the promise of self-service that we were looking for. It looks at tasks that are needed for a worker, and then it can build for you a task list or you can curate it yourself by templating and copying and moving things around on different organizations for whether they're significant life events, things that we used to call moments that matter, or taking a look at you know, required training courses that come up with a a return to the workplace type of requirement. One of the examples that we currently use is uh, Oracle has moved their headquarters from Redwood City in California to Austin, Texas. We have a journey around what would it take if someone were to move from another location down to headquarters, which is now in Austin, and what does that involve? Something as simple as you're having a new 
a new baby, you're having a child, you're adopting a child, you're adding someone to your family. What's involved with that? What steps do you need to think about? How do we get them on healthcare? How do we make sure that we're preparing the home appropriately? What other things does the organization offer us that we can leverage? And, and I didn't know that they were there, but here you can have a journey that is a checklist capability that allows me to go down and it can have due dates on it and, and the like, but it's an organized way for me to complete a process without missing a step. The solution ensures that I'm doing things in the right sequence and I'm also trying to, I'm doing things correctly. Now, on top of that, we've added an additional capability and for the technical people that are listening, there's a component in here called the Journeys Booster, which is in essence, it's BPM, it's business process management in a list. So this is not just a sequential list, which is what others in the market are doing. It's just a sequential punch list of items that might have a predecessor and successor relationship associated with it. We've taken the BPM engine within Oracle and we've tied it to journeys to enable us to do that business process that enables us to do sophisticated if then else logic, case logic, and even other conditional logic and initiate other uh, journeys to be able to be created from either completion or incompletion of those tasks. So from a journey standpoint, we're going well beyond just something that is a guided learning solution that says, in order for you to complete this transaction, go to this field, put in this value, go to this field, put in this value. That's very tedious. What this is doing is guiding you through many of the different steps that are out there. And it makes sure that the, the tasks can be complete quicker, more efficiently, and then also with the best information that's available. So to us, Journeys is pretty powerful. And it's a way that HR is leading, by the way, because it's so powerful that the financials team has come to us when they saw what we were doing and said, we could actually use that to accelerate our month end close. The supply chain team says, we could use Journeys to help our employees locate missing shipments or missing uh, parcels for items that we're shipping cross country. Uh, we can actually use it to put in place maybe um, overall programs that are maintenance plans for our fleet. From a customer perspective, we can use it as ways to engage customers in a follow-up. You bought a new vehicle from me, we talked about that, or you bought a home. You know what, in six months, I'm gonna follow up with you, and another three months, I'll follow up with you with different you know, checkpoints and opportunities that I can actually help serve your organization better. So Journeys is a great way for you to organize thoughts, keep everything out there in a, um, a visible, a queue and enable your organization to operate the way that you know you want to align with everything else, keeping your culture intact as well. Yeah, it's a great intersection between having a great user experience, in this case, you know, the employee, with uh, process or policy enforcement, right? Because in HR, we have to be process driven. We have to we have to be uh, we have to be the enforcers of the policies that we have in place. But a lot of times, if it's driven from the HR perspective, it drives the user crazy because they they don't know everything that they need to do. And sometimes they think they're done, but we'll send them a whole other set of things or links that they have to go to. But having it all in one place and having it automated um, makes the user have a great user experience because now the system is telling them what to do instead of them trying to figure that out. And then from the HR perspective, I know that all the processes are are being followed, which it's it's a it's a great great tool that can build on top of it. Sounds like you've got journeys on top of journeys, so it's uh, I think the combinations can be endless. Um, talk to us about the uh, opportunity marketplace because I, I that's a lot, another feature I really do like a lot, and I think falls in line with what the expectations are these days. Okay, so opportunity marketplace. Well, and it was interesting the story behind how we got here. It, it started probably four years ago. And where it started was with our introduction of the learning management solution. And, and we went in and said, we're not just doing a different learning experience for individuals. It's not just media-based learning that's going to drive the future. TED Talks were really hitting high at that point. And you know, being able to listen to podcasts like this were part of that. But we knew it was going to be more. And to us, where the learning management component led us is we knew that that was going to take a while to to really help build and mature. But we thought about this as a, a talent mobility and an internal mobility capability. So when you start talking about learning management, we then went into career development and began looking at the skills that were going to be necessary 
for an individual to attain their career goals, and then wanted to compare that to what came next was strategic workforce planning and align the career plans with strategic workforce plans, which then led to connections, the talent profile update, and then came opportunity marketplace. So what is opportunity marketplace? Well, looking at that infrastructure, this is the realization of an internal talent acquisition site, not only for finding a new position, but we also looked at it as a way for us to acquire maybe temporary positions and gain experience. And actually during the the, uh, pandemic, as we looked at things, what we came to find with customers is that because their work responsibilities had changed with the shift to working at home and now returning back to the workplace, that the jobs were really changing a bit. Something that I might have done as a side gig, if you will, to help the investor relations team get a summary of what the product development was, and I only do that four hours a month, now became something that I was no longer able to do because I had other priorities that existed at home. I had to you know, be at home for dinner because the caretaker was leaving, I I wanted to spend time with the family, uh, but things became much more regimented. That also opens up opportunities for others to gig, to gain experience, for them to maybe share in, you know, what the challenges that others are working. Now that I'm an empty nester, I actually have more time. So I volunteer to take on some of the workload of my colleagues that have these temporary gigs that are areas that I was interested in as well and wanted to just say, hey, can I help with that? Can I help you with you know, this temporary assignment that you have here? And then I can also uh, have a process within the opportunity marketplace where there can be a group of people that would basically evaluate the qualities of the person that's gonna be hiring and who should actually be accepted for that gig. So in essence, it becomes the internal recruiting system that can be formal or more informal for gigs like this. The only other thing that I would I would add to this is that we're also seeing that this becomes a great place for us to surface other capabilities like volunteering opportunities and projects that are being coordinated by different groups within the organization. And it brings people together as a way for us to really bond on things that are outside the goals that we're assigned at work. These might be uh, things that we're interested in sharing with our community and joining together with coworkers to participate in a Habitat for Humanity project, to look at the you know, March of Dimes walkathon. We may be looking at other volunteering opportunities at a food bank to work together for us to be able to show how our organization cares and gives back to the community. And this is one of the ways that we can organize that. Yeah, and I think it matters. I mean, I think it matters to, to our generation. I think it matters even more to the newer generation coming in to the workplace, it matters that they can work for an organization that does great work, you know, outside of their, their regular business, but even, you know, through community volunteerism and, 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 and the like. So I think this becomes more important than ever. And I just, I just love the fact that it exposes people to other opportunities that they wouldn't know of unless they were at the proverbial water cooler and heard about it. Right. And, and it also gives, uh, people, employees, a way of sharing their skills that nobody may know about. I mean, it may not be on my resume that I know how to do these certain things, but all of a sudden it may be needed somewhere, or maybe there may be a community or a group uh, that that is built around that. And I, and you know, no one would have even brought my name up because they didn't know I had that skill. So I think it's, I think it's just an absolutely fantastic way of uh, of exposing that um, opportunities to other people. It's really fantastic. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think it works both ways, right? Not only people looking for an opportunity to contribute, but then for the system and the when the need arises, you can actually go and look at your first line of support is your existing organization. And are there hidden skills? Are there hidden talents that exist within the workforce that you may never have thought of? You know, Robin worked at the American Red Cross organizing uh, relief efforts uh, in, in a previous life. But we never really even opened that up because it was something that he did while he was in school. Right. And now all of a sudden we have the ability to capture those as skills and previous capabilities and then link them with other opportunities within the organization and then have automation help us identify the people that have relevant experience that is discovered from maybe a, a talent import. You did a, an import from your LinkedIn profile and within your normal you know, work profile, you didn't go back and put in all the things that you did in in college. Well, 
now you you have that swept in from LinkedIn. It now understands, wow, he has all this great relevant experience. We're going to not only build up his skills portfolio based upon that, but in these particular areas, we now know that there's relevant experience that should the opportunity arise, we know we have a deeper bench that we can select from that we didn't realize we had before. Yeah, and proactively notify me when that opportunity happens. I mean, that would be outstanding. And, and that just contributes to employee engagement. Absolutely. You know, if, if I feel like my the organization that I'm working for actually cares about my interests and it cares about, you know, using my skills in, in areas that I may not be aware of based on the role that I've been hired into, I'm more likely to stay with that organization and do more things. Um, that there's, It's just a, you know, definite uh, correlation there. Agreed. Agreed. You know, um, Guy, you're in a unique uh, role with the cloud team because I think you have a lot of visibility into a number of the PeopleSoft customers that are either transitioning over to Oracle HCM Cloud or have already transitioned. I wonder if you could spend a few minutes talking to what what you've observed with uh, with what customers have gone through with that experience. Uh, I mean, I'm sure you've learned a lot, but maybe there's a few things that kind of pop up that that you think the audience would find a pretty interesting. Yeah, I say this. <clears throat> excuse me, with a with a smile on my face because I, I will say that the number one misperception. Uh, is that very few people have moved from PeopleSoft into the cloud. And, and if they have, it, it was not with the Oracle cloud and, and nothing could be further than the truth. A number of organizations have made the transition into the cloud and of the 3,000, 4,000, well, it's actually 4,000 plus now customers that are out there, well over 1,200 of them are PeopleSoft customers that have moved to the cloud. Great company names like JP Morgan Chase, uh, Mount Sinai, American Express, the Willis Towers Watson team uh, has moved as well. And there's an interesting combination there with PeopleSoft and eBusiness Suite, uh, BAE Systems, you know, looking at United Healthcare Group coming in as well. And I think the thing that's common between all of those organizations, other than being a PeopleSoft on-premise customer, is that they all had a unique journey, back to the journeys analogy, but a unique journey to the cloud. No, no real transition to a different HR platform is going to be the same. Everyone has to be able to do things differently. And that, in fact, was what we were thinking about and what we were challenged with when we started building the Cloud HCM product, is that we knew that customers not only demanded the configurability that they had within PeopleSoft today, PeopleTools is a tremendous differentiator. And people are not willing to leave that behind. You need the ability to allow your culture to show through and you're not gonna give that up moving forward. But we had to include that as well. The other is that different parts of the organization had different priorities. You know, the, if you were to ask someone in HR what their number one priority is, they might come down to compliance, they might come down to um, some localization type requirement that exists. Uh, but then if you were to go over into the talent management space, they're going to tell you that talent acquisition is the number one issue that they've got. And it's the chat, it's the battle for talent. Others may tell you that it's the talent development. And depending upon where your organization is, you should be able to start there and work your way forward. But understanding that there is a common destination that you're going to move toward just to make your life more manageable and the business processes uh, easier to achieve. So when we look at someone, for example, BMC Software, I know that they had started with a talent management uh, approach first, and they implemented goals, performance, talent review, succession management first, and then have looked to add on the core HR systems. If I look at someone like United Healthcare Group, same thing, talent management was the first thing that they wanted to, to tackle. And then they've come back and since added the core HR solution. Now, remember, they coexisted with the cloud solution and with the PeopleSoft system. And even to this day, when they have core HR system, they're still coexisting with PeopleSoft. You know why? Because they're running payroll on PeopleSoft. So it's interesting, they transition most of their HR operations over to the cloud, but they're still running PeopleSoft in the cloud, uh, which is identical to what we're doing here from a, an Oracle perspective, because we still run our payroll on premise as well for the Americas. Uh, it's a mixed environment because we actually will run payroll and then uh, export it to some local providers for France and others. But um, 
really, I think that the challenge here was to be able to provide the journey that fits with what their expectations and priorities dictated. That makes sense. And everybody has their own journey to the cloud. And um, it just depends on what's most important, like you said, what their priorities are and how long they expect it to take to get there and um, what they're going to do with their data. Uh, what processes are do they still to, want to continue to move forward in the, in the new system? Uh, how many of the things that they've had customized in PeopleSoft do they still want to carry forward? I can't tell you how many customers will sit down and look at customizations and can't figure out why that customization is there. They just said it was there. <laughs> We've been right. doing it for years. So, uh, but everyone's journey to the cloud is definitely different. You know, as we wrap up here, I wanted to find out from you, I've been telling customers, people solve customers that when it comes to the cloud, just be aware and educate yourself. Maybe once every year or so, maybe even more often, just depends on how busy you are, you know, look up, Take a look up uh, the forest through the trees and just read up on what's going on. You know, attend one of our sessions at at one of the conferences on the cloud, or even engage with a sales rep to to get a demo just to kind of see how it works. What advice would you give to PeopleSoft customers who you know they're running PeopleSoft right now? They know they've got the commitment from Oracle for many years to come. But what sort of advice would you give them beyond what I've been telling them for the past uh, couple of years now? It's a great question. And- Particularly, I think it's it's a relevant one, uh, seeing what we've experienced in the year 2020 and now in 2021, continuing through. Anticipate things, don't, don't anticipate things are going to stay the same. Great stories that we had coming out of uh, actually experiencing a lot of the challenges that we've had over the past several quarters, lockdowns and shutdowns and the like. And the one thing that I hear constantly is, I'm really so pleased that we've been able to enable our organization to continue functioning and working during the shutdown and being able to do things remotely. As I look at the future out there for the PeopleSoft customers, I would say prepare for change. Look at things as simple as data quality analysis. This is gonna be important no matter what because what we're seeing is the next big thing in HR is the application of artificial intelligence and automation of decisions that are happening All of that's going to be dependent upon how clean your data is. As good as that's going to work, whether it's a reporting perspective, whether it's an execution perspective, uh, robotic process automation that people are talking about these days, all depends on clean data. That's really what gets people when they start trying to unwind a lot of the customizations, Robin, that you just referred to. They, They didn't understand why this was there because that guy that was here 15 years ago said that's what he needed to do and we just didn't undo it when he left. You need to be able to look at the data quality and look at the process quality as well. And then try and purge some of those unnecessary things, simplify from your business process, because there's a cost to you carrying those unnecessary configurations that you've made with people tools forward. And then the other is what that's going to do is help reacquaint you with your data structures, with the cleanliness of your data, with the accuracy of your reporting. uh, And it helps you lighten the load, I think, a good bit. That's definitely one of the things that I look at within any implementation strategy for customers that are beginning to look at transitioning, moving from one environment to another, regardless of what it is, is to take a look at those business processes and rationalize them. I encourage you to do that one. The other is, you know, there's the old state saying that we want to actually look at starting small, thinking big, and moving fast. All that means is that we eat an elephant one bite at a time. And If you look at something that you're trying to work with in transformation, that's a lot of syllables in that word, and it's a long one, but if you can break it down to actually starting small, and it always is that every journey starts with the first step, but then also have that grand vision that you know you're going to attain at some point, and don't worry about the time frame to get there, but begin taking action and doing it repetitively. One of the themes that we had on this call today was to really talk about CICD, which is the continuous innovation and continuous um, deployment. And that whole process of continuous and never ending improvement is something that I encourage you to in, embed in your culture today if you've not done it already. And you're going to see the benefits no matter where you're headed with a system perspective, that's gonna help you adopt new HR business techniques moving forward and realize the benefits, no matter what technology that you use. 
This is not about technology. This is all about how you manage your workforce, how you enable your team to be the most productive, the most efficient, and the most effective team uh, that's serving the interests of not only your organization, but for your customers. So hopefully that's something that can give people a little bit of insight, something that you can do now and take away from this call. We certainly have customers that we can have you share some of the experiences with where they've gone through a transition from one platform to another platform, how they did it. Uh, there's a number of stories that exist out there, and I know that they'll be happy to to share theirs with you. Yeah, you know, I think you make a great point. You know, continuous delivery, continuous development, that's here to stay. I mean, we do it in the PeopleSoft side. It's being done no matter where you go. I mean, that's that's the that's the way things are happening these days. That's how you keep up with the the pace of change that's happening, not just in technology, but just in the industry. And you referenced last year. I mean, just look at look at the situation we're in now, even just with the um the you know, looking to get talent, bringing talent on board. Things can just change at the drop of a hat. And when that does happen, you need to have the functionality in the product to meet those needs. And um, I think I think you're right. Anything customers can do to prepare for that pace of change and continuous delivery, whether they're staying on PeopleSoft or not, is is going to be a long-term benefit for sure. So let me give you my crystal ball moment yeah, here. Pull so out that crystal ball. Is, six months, what do you see? The next six months, this is something that, that I've been working on for a while, but we were talking about, you know, the challenges of being working from different locations and, and the like and returning to the workplace will have its own challenges. I mentioned, you know, my youngest son actually joining a company and he graduated in one quarter, two months later, he was at work behind his desk, but his desk happened to be in the front bedroom of his apartment. <laughs> and he's never been in an office environment. And now we're beginning to look at the return to work process and go to the workplace. And depending upon the different schedules that people have, we're going to have to consider re-onboarding everyone that's been hired in the last 12 to 18 months. Mm -hmm. Think about that as a challenge to your organization. You're gonna to have to think about reestablishing a culture because the culture that they have when they started work in an environment and not standing around the water cooler and teaching others to work and, and working together as a team, that's something that's, very different that we've not experienced in our professional lives. The other thing that I would look at is don't just assume that the new people in the workforce or the new people as part of the company are the only ones affected by that re-onboarding. People that have been around, like myself, have been at Oracle for 15 plus years. What's it going to be like when I go back to the workplace? Do I need to have some onboarding to understand, again, what is this workplace thing going to look like now? What are the new ways that we're going to work together? And, and have we changed in the last 18 months? Because I've been working from my home office for that period of time. That's the number one challenge that we're going to see on the horizon. And a lot of automation is going to help with that one. But the other thing that it never can be replaced, and HR people need to have this constantly, it's that face-to-face, human-to-human interaction. No system, no automation, no innovation will ever replace the empathetic touch and constant contact of a real HR professional. So as we begin looking at the challenges that we know are going to always face us as folks that are trying to help others be the best that they can be, let's go ahead and focus on what really makes a difference with the organization. And I think that over the next 12 months, helping people you know, gain their footing again, to establish their career plans, to understand what we're really about as a uh, part of the organization and enabling a workforce to be the best it can be, is where I'd like to see us take, you know, all of our customers in our community. Yeah, that's well said. I mean, really just kind of get back to normal, <laughs> if I do say so. Get back to the way it used to be, right? Um, I agree. That was well said. I think we'll leave it on that note, Guy. Uh, it's been my pleasure to have you on the podcast. Time flew by for us. Thanks for taking the time to talk with me today. Thanks, Robin. I want to thank everyone for listening and for your support. Don't forget to help spread the word about the PeopleSoft Chat podcast and contact me with your suggestions for future guests and topics. Until then, be well and be safe. Thank you for listening to the PeopleSoft Chat podcast. If you have any feedback or questions, please feel free to reach out to Robin over email at robin.velitem at oracle.com. 